It seems a very complex operation making a program like that. You popped up in, in any number of locations throughout one hour. Uh, did you assemble the whole thing afterwards, or was every shot, every frame planned in advance? Oh, you absolutely ha you have to plan it in advance. Even if you're going to discard the plan, you have to have a plan. Uh, and you can't actually do a sequence in which you um, start off in North America and start speaking a sentence, and you end the sentence on the Barrier Reef in Australia. Um, so you have to write it to that extent. Neither is it any good going to Australia in order to look at coral and then getting on an airplane, and when you come back, say, ah! I knew there was something. What about those big things that hop? You know, <laughs> we've done those. You, so you have to write the entire series before you start. How about the, the, the serendipity of, of things like the, the scene with the apes, which yes. is a lovable scene? Oh, well, that was astounding. I mean, I, I mean, what happened there was it in the original script, I wrote down gorillas because um, <laughs> part of the way, part of the reasons why these things go into the scripts is, of course, naturally, their zoological importance, but also whether I've not seen them or not. <laughs> I mean, whether, so I would um, naturally put in gorillas, because I hadn't seen gorillas, I thought. And what's more, I put in a, a sequence in which I was talking about gorillas to make sure I, sure I went there. Um, and um, I knew what I wanted to say. Uh, but of course, you can't predict what's going to happen. And for example, um, John Sparks, who was the director, Tell, it tells this story. He says that uh, I was crawling towards these gorillas, and he actually whispered to me and said, you know, talk about the opposition of the thumb and the forefinger and its importance in primate evolution. I thought he was round the bend, you know, because there are these wonderful apes. You know, we're talking about the opposability of the thumb and forefinger. So I looked to him to do something, and then John says, he says, I turned around to check on the camera. When I turned back again, there was this huge female gorilla that had David's head between her hands. And I thought, good Lord, he says John, she's going to tear his head off, and we've only done two-thirds of the programs. <laughs> <laughs> and then she kissed you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the viewers aren't aware, but it's not simply you that's uh, in the location. There's got to be a cameraman, a sound man, a director as well. And that number of people moving into those situations can cause technical problems. Was there ever any danger in situations you found yourselves in? No, no. Uh, I mean, I, it's not only was I not conscious of danger, but I don't actually, I'm not consciously aware I've gone into danger. I mean, I, I, I don't think we did dangerous things. And I, and I think it'd be very irresponsible to do dangerous things because you've got a three-year program and you've got a lot of money and, you know, you can't afford to sort of do something and say, oh, well, if I break my leg, you know, that's three months off uh, and we'll go on afterwards because you can't take three months off. I mean, some of the things look dangerous and they aren't. I mean, um, to that extent, they're probably a mistake. But, I mean, a mistake to put in the film. But, for example, at the end of the reptile film, uh, the payoff to the program, the last thing about reptiles, problems and so on, is done with me... It starts on a close-up of a rattlesnake coiled up, shaking its tail, its rattle, and then it, it pan, the camera pans up and I am revealed, sitting by a cactus, saying something poignant about the significance of reptile anatomy. Uh, and I'm clearly within, uh, what, I don't know, eight feet of this rattlesnake. And people say, wasn't that terribly dangerous? Uh, well, the fact of the matter is that you don't have to be the most knowledgeable naturalist in the world to know that snakes don't have legs. Uh, and if you don't have legs, you can't jump. Uh, and a snake, uh, if it's curled up, can only strike at something which is within its length, because all it does is by striking is straighten out its body. So that if the snake is two foot six long, it can't bite anything that's farther away than two foot six. Well, I'll say two foot nine to mm -hmm. allow a little bit of shuffle. So if you actually sit four feet away, there's no Same. way in that snake can bite you, except by uncoiling and going through the laborious business of, of moving towards you. Well, then you move back and you say to the cameraman, sorry, a couple of minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> and many of us, when we're making programs, we do a series and we say, yeah, that was good, but there were a few things wrong with it. You have done, as we've said, your masterwork. I mean, what can you do to follow that up? Oh, no, I haven't done the definitive thing. I mean, I, um, and there are a lot of things that I think are wrong with it. Um, things that didn't quite hit the nail on the head um, and things we didn't quite get quite right. Um, 
I don't think I want to try and say, okay, we'll remake the whole series and start from the beginning again, but there are other ways of looking at the natural world apart from the way in which it developed, the history, as it were, of life. Uh, there are many other ways, there are the relationship, interrelationships between animals, and that's the sort of thing I'm thinking about now. That's the follow-up. Mm. You're here in Ireland at the moment in connection with conservation. Outside of your professional life, is that your major preoccupation? Yes, and it's closely connected with my professional life. Uh, I mean, I think that the world at large is in grave danger, uh, the natural world. Uh, and, and it's not just that we may lose a species, an interesting species, even an interesting species as a gorilla, which certainly we are in danger of losing, but that we are in danger because we are, mankind is so powerful, we are in danger actually of turning the world into a wasteland. And it used to be thought, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, and I've been in, interested in conservation for a long time, it used to be thought that somehow conservation was against development, and development was against conservation, and, and it was a question of whether you choose one or the other. We now realize that is absolutely not the case. The two things are the same. Uh, one can't proceed without the other. If we didn't have development, we, the, the nations of the world, the population of the world, would starve within the next two or three decades. We have to develop. Equally, unless we develop along sensible ecological lines, there will be global catastrophe anyway, and everybody will die. So development and, and conservation must proceed together with the same objectives and the same plan. Is it only, though, in the underdeveloped areas in Africa, the third world, and so on, which are threatened by this, or closer to home here in, in these islands, are we doing things which are, are, are threatening our landscapes, our wildlife, our ability to produce food? Oh, yes, of course we are. Um, the rate at which agricultural land in England, for example, has been lost to motorways, to um, uh, factories, buildings, to be, I mean, where we could have sited towns or developments on unproductive land. We've actually thought we had all the productive land we wanted in the world and put on the, on the, on the, under the motorways. Uh, not only that, we have treated the land uh, with uh, a technological contempt uh, in that we have simply rooted up all the hedgerows. And we said, oh, well, we can get a quicker, uh, we can get a quicker return if we, uh, if we do that. And, and we have uh, had great problems with insecticides by pouring chemical poisons on the place. I mean, we're beginning to learn now. But, um, but the fact is that we have lost a lot of the, uh, of the natural population of, of the United Kingdom. We have actually poisoned it. Uh, we have actually wasted good land. We cannot afford to go on doing this. Can there be a solution to this kind of thing? And, and do you see what you're doing now, heightening public awareness, as an important part of that solution? Well, that, uh, you can't do anything unless you have public awareness, in my view. Uh, because it is not only nationally that we've got to do this, but we've got to do it internationally. Because birds migrate, seas flow, rivers spread. Uh, it's no good actually doing a, a wonderful um, uh, conservation around your shores and stopping people polluting it with uh, oil tanker spillage or whatever around your shores if on the other side of the channel people are, are not caring because the result is the same. So it has to be international. It has to be global. And the only way that you will actually bring that about is that there is a, an awareness worldwide. There's a thing called the World Conservation Strategy, which has just been launched, which shows that we are actually beginning to achieve that. And I'm not all that pessimistic, because although I know that the dangers are really intense, the fact is that we have made a shift. We have, within the last few years, people have suddenly, ordinary people, said, look, it is crazy, as well as immoral, to go slaughtering whales. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's monstrous that we should kill them in that way. Um, but equally, if industry says we have to have their oil, what is the sense of it killing them to the point of extermination so that, we, that they won't be there anyway? So the nations are moving. So things are happening. David Attenborough, thank you very much for talking to us.